Your body and mind are so inextricably linked as to be inseparable. This means that training the body is also training the mind, and vice versa. It could be argued that movement and learning to move is the primary function of the human brain. While learning about ancient history is a mentally taxing process, it's nowhere near as multisensory or rich in information as learning to move the body. This requires not only knowledge of the intended movement, but also information from every single sense and as much of the body as possible. Movement begins in the brain. Before you can move, you first need to enact that movement in the brain in order to refine it. The intention to move begins in the posterior parietal cortex, an area that has been linked with the concept of free will. The basal ganglia provides you with action selection to choose that movement. We then refer to the cerebellum, the little brain, named by Leonardo da Vinci, in order to incorporate information from our surroundings. This includes detailed proprioceptive feedback from the sensors in our muscles, tendons and fascia, that provide us with a detailed picture of the current position of our body and its balance. The premotor cortex combines this information with a detailed concept of physics, learned from countless interactions with the world, to help position us in space and refine the movement further. The motor cortex then lights up with a pattern that directly corresponds to that movement, letting us curl the weight or throw that punch. During all this, the brain essentially predicts what the movement will look like. If the finalised movement lines up with that prediction, the neural patterns that we use to strengthen via reinforcing neurochemicals. Again, a lot of this takes place in the cerebellum, which is essentially a learning and prediction machine. If the movement is wrong and there's a prediction error, then the movement is refined next time. This neural plasticity allows us to learn new skills and movements and to continuously adapt to our environments. And this is why learning entirely new skills, such as dance, choreography or martial arts, is fantastic for increasing neural plasticity. The very process of learning presents a swathe of plasticity promoting chemicals that can then be used to further support learning in other areas. I don't know if there's any evidence to support this, but theoretically you might find that learning a new martial art could help you to learn a new language, and even vice versa. Heck, it might even help you to bench more. Ido Portal, the movement guru, is someone I'll talk about more on this channel in future. His philosophy is to train movements rather than muscles, and he is one of the most prominent figures in the new movement training uh, movement. Ido believes that the acquisition of new skill goes through multiple stages, starting off very difficult before going through a period of refinement and eventually mastery. Ido believes that we should spend more time in the first and second stages. This is where the most learning is occurring and as such the biggest benefits to our plasticity and cognitive development. So many of us focus on mastering movements, on adding a few kilos to a lift that we're already very proficient at. Far more transformative is to learn something entirely new, constantly. Research conducted by Tracy and Ross Alloway shows that activities such as climbing trees, crawling on beams and running barefoot are powerful tools for enhancing working memory. These, coincidentally, are the kinds of activities we would naturally engage in as children. Alloway also suggests that activities such as surfing might be perfect for this kind of thing. What if you don't move? What if you only picture moving? In that scenario, we still see very similar activity in the brain. This means that we can actually rehearse movements in our mind's eye and strengthen the very same neural pathways. If you visualise throwing a ball, you will actually use the precise same neural networks and you can strengthen those connections in just the same way, making the movement more efficient and precise without even moving. And what's strangest about this of all is that this very process of being able to move without moving might underpin the very nature of our cognition. This is the hypothesis put forwards by embodied cognition, and specifically the idea of embodied semantics. As you listen to this, you are translating everything I say into pure meaning. You have learned English, but what was your basis of reference when learning that? If English is the programming language, then what is the machine code of the brain? Embodied semantics is a school of thought, which is just a theory mind you, that suggests that the basis for thought is movement and first-hand experience. When I tell you about an experience that I had walking through cold woods, you understand this by activating brain regions that correspond with that experience. In other words, you recall the sensation of walking through the woods, you feel your legs move slightly, you feel and hear the crunching of twigs underfoot, and you remember what emotions this conjured up for you in the past. Without a body and without direct experience, you'd have no way of understanding the concept of walking through the woods. We see this when we try to translate something to a stranger. We do so by mimicking and aping the actions we're trying to describe, or by desperately pointing at things that could provide a shared reference point. And likewise, this helps to explain, to some extent, why memories can trigger vivid emotional reactions as though they were real, and even why we gesticulate and mimic as we speak. It explains how thoughts can occur without language. 
It's not visualization as such, and it's not just kinesthetic experience either. Rather, it's a multi-sensory experience created in your mind's eye, or your visuospatial scratch pad to use the correct terminology. We even see this in the way that language developed. See Daniel L. Everett's Sign Progression Theory of Language and the excellent video on the topic over at What I've Learned. This is the seat of your working memory, your ability to hold on to sensory information and concepts, and thus your ability to imagine, to extrapolate and to predict. The prefrontal cortex, which evolved much later than the hindbrain that houses the cerebellum, is where our ability to engage in abstract thought occurs, but this is still apparently built on top of our grounded experience. Could you understand and perform maths without an experience of quantities? This might also explain our proclivity for metaphors. It also points to a connection between the working memory and the movement of the body. This might help us to understand how something like a bear crawl along a tree branch could possibly result in greater math skills. And it explains why the cerebellum features connections that reach deeply into the prefrontal cortex. It explains why more and more studies are demonstrating a role for the cerebellum and the premotor cortex in seemingly unrelated cognitive tasks because these functions underpin our ability to think abstractly. In one study, it was even found that wrestlers would use their motor regions more than average people when performing cognitive tasks such as mentally rotating objects. Most people relied more on their visual cortex, but it turned out that using their bodies was actually more effective for the wrestlers. And this might also explain how practicing fine motor skills like cursive can improve skills such as verbal fluency. The Arrowsmith School uses cursive drills and tracing exercises to help children that struggle with language. Many of them develop skills equal to or even superior to their peers using this method. There's a well-documented link between the premotor cortex and speech production, and careful manipulation may help to develop the former. This is another takeaway then. Engage in some activity that requires fine, precise control of your hands. We're not just talking about exercise here. And again, the cerebellum is also a learning engine. It plays a huge role in refining movement and predicting outcomes, which may also help to conceive higher order concepts and predictions. The cerebellum has around 69 billion neurons, as compared with the 16 billion found in the cerebral cortex. That's surely worth thinking about. This is why I believe that any attempt to create a disembodied artificial intelligence, that is to say an artificial intelligence with no physical presence, will prove to be unsuccessful. A true general AI would at the very least require an artificial environment. It may be the co-evolution between environment and organism that gives rise to intelligence. This video only scratches the surface of the deeply complex relationship between the mind and the body. For instance, consider the way that our physiology can impact on our mindset and vice versa. Learning to understand this reaction allows us to gain greater self-mastery, a topic that is referred to as physical intelligence by some, or interoception. Then there's the ability to increase strength and performance by enhancing the mind-muscle connection. Or what about the link between intention and performance? A simple trick like punching through the bag rather than into it can have a profound effect on the way we deliver a strike. I could also talk about how improving cardio has been shown to increase BDNF, one of those key substances promoting plasticity in the hippocampus, the primary brain region responsible for memory. Exercise also leads to a short-term increase in endorphins, the feel-good hormones, and of course, improving your cardiovascular system will also upgrade the supply of oxygen to the brain. Stay tuned as I'll discuss all of this in future videos, but to end I'd just like to reinforce the importance of training the mind as well as the body. Neuroplasticity shows us that areas of the brain and the connections between them can be developed and strengthened just like any muscle, more so even. So why do we worry about a legs day without ever considering a brain day? So I hope you found this video useful and interesting guys, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Do you notice any cognitive benefits of training or vice versa? How do you combine them both? Subscribe and hit the notification bell if you want more like this, and if you enjoy this philosophical approach to training the mind and body for better human performance, you might enjoy my ebook and training program, Super Functional Training. I go into a lot more detail in that and provide my most actionable advice and programming to suit all levels. Check it out in the link below, there's a discount on right now as many of us are still stuck in lockdown. Thanks a ton for watching this one guys, and I'll catch you next time. Bye for now. Oh, and by the way guys, I made all these 3D graphics myself, so I'd love to know what you think of them in the comments below. Want to see more of them, or should I just stick to what I know?